thanks for saying that everybody at ITAP for organizing this. And, uh, it takes a lot of work to organize an event like that. It's incredible. I've done it with many other people once at birthday, and it's just crazy. But it needs to happen, and so good people sometimes make it happen. You should all be grateful for that. Okay, yeah, my name is Holger Müller. I'm teaching at UC Berkeley. I'm an atomic physicist, atomic molecular and optical physics. My real speciality is matter wave interferometry, so mostly atom interferometry, but also a little bit of electron interferometry. Um, but before I go into technical details about this kind of work, I would like to very broadly introduce our field, because one thing I strongly believe is that this, I mean, maybe it's my self-centric view, right? But we may be at the beginning of a new era in physics. Let me explain. In the 40s and 50s and 60s, physicists were famous, were relevant on the political debate and on day-to-day -day discussion at breakfast tables everywhere because they made nuclear power for peaceful purposes and for not peaceful purposes, right? They, that was causing the Cold War, it caused a proliferation of nuclear power to power the economy, it caused a lot of um, problems, it caused a protest movement and so on. That has largely subsided, although there are still things like North Korea trying to acquire nuclear weapons, but they are not talked about it anymore in physics terms. Um, physicists lost a lot of funding because of that. Um, there is now only the LHC as, as a cutting-edge particle physics experiment. There were lots of national labs doing particle physics before. But physics has managed to stay relevant, and I have two examples here. Many of these examples wouldn't even count as quantum technology or quantum sensing. Because in atomic physics, we sometimes have this unhealthy attitude to say if it's not an entangled multi-particle state and it's squeezed, then it's not really quantum. Okay. But I want to point out that the laser is very quantum and it's very relevant. This is the Apache Point Lunar Laser Ranging Operation. can measure the distance between the Earth and the Moon to such a high degree of precision that you can test general relativity with that to almost the highest precision ever um, has recently been surpassed by the microscope satellite testing the equivalence principle. This can do 10 to the minus 13 measurements of the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So precisely that you need to know about the Moon's seismic activity to make sense of the data. Okay. And it's all made possible by the laser. There is a proliferation of atomic clocks that are so precise that you can triangulate your position at the speed of light using the GPS. Cell phone does it, your cell phone does it, right? Everybody uses it all the time and they're not even thinking that there are atomic clocks up there. Those atomic clocks are not cutting edge by our standards, so we would probably not take, call them serious atomic clocks anymore. But they are so good that we can measure time by nanoseconds, and that allows us to tell that the cell phone is. The food we had at breakfast was perhaps brought to you by GPS, because GPS is now used by farmers to guide their tractors around the field. Okay, This is how much atomic physics has to contribute to everyday life. And we should not be too arrogant to discount these things as not really physics because it's not really entangled and something like that, right? Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. The next thing I want to say is that <coughs> physics has very much managed to stay in the news. And I feel that there are two main directions, two main thrusts in physics that have managed to stay in the news. The first one is here. This is the actual title of Time magazine a couple of years ago, talking about quantum computing. And they raise issues that affect everybody who doesn't even know how to spell quantum. Like, will quantum computers 
break all our encryption? Will my email no longer be safe? And when will that be the case? Will we be able to develop better encryption before quantum computers break all our encryption? Right. Will it lead to a new age where computing power is so abundant that it will transform humanity for better and for worse, just like nuclear power was a source of energy that could be so abundant that it transforms humanity? And in the 50s, they talked about nuclear heat and swimming pools for scuba divers, right? I believe that the quantum computing that we talk about today are the analogy of the nuclear heat and swimming pool, meaning that they will be very far from what really happens in 30 years or 40 years when quantum computers will be used. But we have to go through this phase, and there is already a lot of political discussion. At the same time, Maybe quantum communication comes to the rescue and provides a bulletproof way to securely communicate. So not only the problem may be quantum, but the solution may be quantum. Right? So this is the first way in which I think quantum technology and thereby physics will stay relevant or maybe gain more relevant. This is obviously not what I'm an expert in, so I will not talk about it much. What I will talk about is precision measurement. I still remember where I sat at which table at home trying to download the LIGO paper when it came out, and it had crashed the PRL server. So that's a real measure of impact of your paper. Can you crash the journal server? I think they were the only ones that ever managed to do that. So what did they do? They used mostly classical light. It was not squeezed. Right? It was not any kind of, it was a coherent state. They got as close as possible to the quantum limit that you reach before you apply fancy quantum tricks such as squeezing. But the source of light that they used was a laser, and as such it was very quantum. With that, they opened up a whole new window to the cosmos. Until recently, all information we had about anything that's not on the ground came to us by electromagnetic radiation, with its powers and with its limitations. And now we have gravitational radiation, and even this very first event told us something new about the cosmos. <coughs> because it came from the collision of two 30 solar mass black holes. And those black holes before were discarded as something that would be extremely scarce in the universe. There would be lots of small black holes, a few solar masses, and very few supermassive black holes at the cores of galaxies. But essentially, black holes in between would be few and far in between. Now this is a collision between two black holes, each weighing 30 solar masses. So even this first event tells us something that some conception behind what astrophysics was wrong. We need to come up with an explanation how come that 30 solar mass black holes are so abundant that the very first event we detect comes from such a collision. Right? Not an astrophysicist, I have no idea how fundamental or not this is. But new window will show us new things. Now we're getting to the heart of it. Let's talk a little bit about some examples for precision measurements and in which other ways can they help pushing fundamental physics forward the way that the quest for better nuclear power pushed fundamental physics forward in the accelerator age. This is a couple of figures I stole from Dave Dimmel, um, and it's about the advanced code molecule EDM collaboration. So essentially the idea is an electron obviously has a magnetic dipole moment, we all know that, and as far as we know it has no electric dipole moment. Um, perhaps in the standard model, you could say even if a bare electron has no electric dipole moment, the real electron always couples to vacuum fluctuations of all sorts of fields, some of which break CP symmetry, and therefore the electron acquires a tiny, tiny, tiny effective electric dipole moment. 
The point is that if you start to extend the standard model, and maybe introduce supersymmetry and so on, this electric dental moment grows a lot. And the experiments that have been started long ago by Eugene Cummins at Berkeley, and then slightly surpassed um, by an experiment at Imperial College in London by Ed Hines, and then strongly surpassed by these guys, I think this would be Eugene Cummins here. And then, it's, yeah, this is, I think, at Hines, so it's slightly better. And then we're here now, and we'll soon be there. Right? This eats strongly into the parameter space of supersymmetry. So it's not just the failure of the LHC to detect superpartners. It is also the failure of experiments like that to detect electric dipole moments of electrons that rule out supersymmetry. Because most people that care about supersymmetry are still paid by particle physics grants, this is receiving less press than it should. But I think it is very powerful in terms of either finding or ruling out this fundamental physics model. The way it works is you're using a molecule. It's a polar molecule where most of the charge is in one of the atoms and most of the polar are in the other part of the molecule, having a tremendously strong electric field inside. With a weak electric field from the outside, you can align those molecules. And then you can look for the effect of the internal electric field on the electron. And if the electron has an electric dipole moment, there will be an interaction term that shifts your energy levels and that's detected. Right? The key point is that in those experiments with single atoms, all the electric field had to be applied with external electrons. In molecule experiments, you apply a small electric field from the outside, thus orienting all the molecules the same way, and then you gain a huge lever arm. It takes a small electric field to align all the huge electric fields in the molecules. That's the origin of this process. Going to LIGO. LIGO is the kind of experiment that enabled by atomic, molecular, and optical physics comes closest to the mode of operation of high energy particle people. Okay. LIGO did not just manage to brilliantly solve lots of very hard physics problems, they also managed to create a team. To build something like LIGO, you need a group that builds a better isolator for your laser, a lower loss isolator. If I write a grant to NSF saying I want to build a better isolator, they say you're crazy. This is the National Science Foundation, not the National Engineering Foundation, said so there's a better proposal. LIGO managed to convince NSF to fund just that. And the way you do that is you build up a community of researchers that appreciate the need for that. Yes, it may be a humble isolator, but without the humble isolator, LIGO won't work. So please, dear NSF, help us build that isolator. They managed to do that. Also, they managed to make sure that the people that should be collaborating are, in fact, collaborating. There's no competition between LIGO Hanford and LIGO Livingstone. In other fields, that's the exact thing that happens. There was an infamous discovery of the beam modes and gravitational wave background that turned out to be wrong. That was because two teams that should have been collaborators were competitors. The signal was the difference between the two measurements of the two teams. So if you are the first to publish, then you lose, because then the second team can take the difference and write the discovery paper. Right? And so the teams tried to sidestep that by guessing what the other team was about to publish and then publishing first. Right? This did not happen in Vigo. They go to both those. Um, one here, one here, the Livingstone and Hanford. And the coincidence analysis of the two signals made the gravitational wave detection bulletproof. It's not just a national collaboration, it's also an international collaboration. And they now have joint detections together with their European counterparts. Again, collaboration, not competition. Anyway, 
let's look at some of the things that LIGO did. Um, there's Morgan Holland, obviously, here. And one of the things that LIGO inspired was the construction of extremely frequency stable lasers. LIGO, as such, does not worry so much about laser frequency noise, but they were still the first that needed a 10 watt or nowadays even stronger laser having cutting edge noise specification. And this triggered work um, in all sorts of laser stabilization things, optical cavities. Or here, this example is a fancy figure. Um, about the super radiant laser that I don't know if you will talk about it, but it's a way to get speaking of lasers would you like one picture? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is it super radiant? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, the idea here is really the ideas are simple, right? Essentially could I make a laser where the frequency is not determined mostly by the resonance of the cavity, but mostly by the gate profile of the gate medium? It turns out, yes, you can. It turns out, yes, it is more frequency stable. LIGO figures that out the basic problem. A mirror is at a temperature, and that means its surface fluctuates a little bit, and that causes noise, right? That has been studied discovered and studied by LIGO. LIGO has been able to get its noise extremely close to the quantum limit. So they have started all this study of quantum non-demolition measurement, of squeezing, and they are now beginning to apply squeezing. So none of the published LIGO discoveries have used squeezing yet, but they have now installed it and I think see a 1 dB increase in signal to noise. So it will be applied. Future. LIGO started all this work. What they also started is the whole field of optomechanics. The back action of the light, the radiation pressure in a LIGO arm on the mirror is so strong as to have a substantial effect on the position of the mirror. Moreover, the whole system is resonant, right? There are cavities in the arm. They and hence the laser intensity. So what happens is the radiation pressure pushes the mirrors apart. That modifies the resonance frequency of the cavity, moving it either closer to your laser frequency or further away. And depending on which case it is, the effect is self-reinforcing, meaning the cavity anti-locks itself. It's running away from being resonant or the cavity pulls itself to the frequency of the laser, causing a passive stability of the system. If you now change the laser frequency, the cavity will adjust by itself. So that's optomechanics, essentially radiation pressure acting on the mirror, changing the um, resonance frequency, thereby changing the radiation pressure. If you take this to the limit, and LIGO isn't far from that limit, you get into a regime of quantum optomechanics, where the radiation pressure of a single photon is enough to do something to your mirror. This is a field in its own right now, but it was started by this effort. By finally, plots. Um, I, I should make a disclaimer that I haven't participated in any of the work that I've um, presented so far, and that's what allows me to brag about it shamelessly. <laughs> And that continues to be the case with this slide. This is the accuracy of atomic clocks over time, starting with the first cesium atomic clock by Essen and Perry in 56, and ending with some of the best atomic clocks that are now made at National Metrology Labs, such as um, Boulder, Jeanette Boulder. And the latest data point is somewhere here from this experiment, the strontium optical lattice clock and the group of Jundi. This is Sarah Campbell, who was one of the grad students who made it happen, and who I am now shamelessly pregnant will join our group at Berkeley as a postdoc soon. So what they managed is something remarkable. All these clocks here do their best possible job at isolating the atoms from one another as well as they can, by either using only single atoms, 
that would be the ion flux. They use a single ion, so you don't have to worry about ion-ion interactions. Or by using extremely dilute samples. But there comes a point where this fails. Because if your sample is extremely dilute, that means you could get more signal to noise by adding more atoms. But that would increase atom-atom interactions, which in this context are horrible systematic effects, so you don't want them. So one way to do that is to arrange the atoms in some sort of 1D, 2D, or 3D optical lattice. But then they will start um, doing collective effects that may help you or that may hurt you. In this case, they have employed them to help, so they control the interactions um, with strontium atoms and lattices. So clocks are really amazing in the sense that there's a Morse law here. If you draw a line from here to here, you get about a doubling of the precision every other year. There are not many fields of human endeavor who have achieved such a thing. The semiconductor industry is the most famous one. Many other research-intensive undertakings that are super important do not have a Morse law. Right? Pharmaceutical industry, I wouldn't even know how to measure it in a 2D plot. They're super useful, they're research-intensive, and yet only a few fields have managed to do that. Atomic clocks is one of them. And some of them are now super small, right? This has a 10 to minus 11 long-term stability. Costs $100, and it's that small. It's also an economic plot. Oh, okay. can I make a just a brief comment? Like, yeah. All those points on your slide there are basically single atom physics. You know? Everything right. up to today, you've been able to think of as clocks based on atoms one by one. And I think one of the big things that's happening now is you're at a frontier where that big collective system, you really need to understand many body physics to go for the next you know, order of magnitude. So. Right. Um, thank you for that comment. That's exactly the point that I'm going to make a few slides from now. I'm so I'll repeat it. This is all single atom physics. Atom atom interaction is a horrible systematic that you want to suppress as much as you can. And I think one of the three things that quantum technology should be trying to achieve in the next decade or so is to not view them as just a problem, but to employ them to become part of the solution. That's important. That's right. OK. Um, let me switch a little bit to atom interferometry, and this is now getting closer to my own topic. Let me also see what we're doing on time. Okay. So what's an, what's an atom interferometer? In some sense, it's very similar to a light <coughs> interferometer. You take matter waves, right? Just like light is a wave, so is matter. It has a wavelength. You can take a matter wave, send it on two paths. Don't worry about exactly how this is accomplished. We'll talk about that in detail later. And at the end, they interfere. This is an actual picture of the atomic population taken in our lab. Depending on what the phase difference between the matter wave packets is, the atoms will either all come out here, or they will all come out there, or somewhere in between. If you measure these fringes, you can measure the phase. And by measuring the phase, you can measure anything that affects the phase, such as um, any forces acting on the atoms will change the phase forces. I should say potentials um, to be accurate that forces will do. You can measure properties of the atoms, such as their mass, and thereby measure fundamental constants. You can use gravity measurements for navigational purposes. And what you will hear more about um, from other speakers in this winter school is perhaps one day they will even make a dark matter or a gravitational wave detector. What's so fancy about interferometers such as LIGO or such as atom interferometers is they have a very large lever arm to convert small fractional influences on the atoms into large fractional changes of the probability to detect an atom. And the reason for that is that the matter waves oscillate a great number of times between when they're split and when they're recombined. For example, LIGO has a four kilometer arm length that is extended by a factor of 100 
from putting mirrors in to have the beams bounce back and forth a lot. So now you have a hundreds of kilometers travel path and you have a one micron wavelength that gives you a 10 to the 11 or 10 to 12 amplification factor for small changes. Right. This is the detected atom number plotted as function of phase in an atom interferometer that has actually been built. This is not data, this is plotted with Mathematica, but it's plotted to scale. So you don't see anything because the fringes are so high. So let's zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And this is where you begin to see something. And this is after a final stage of zooming in actual data. This is data I can also brag about because it was taken by Ken Yong Chang at Stanford 15 years ago. This is not even state of the art. It was state of the art for a long time. This is the tremendous resolution that's possible by massive astronomy. And of course, our job is to make it better. So um, maybe one day and zoom out once more. What you can do with that is, for example, measuring fundamental constants. And this is a measurement we've recently finalized. It's the most accurate measurement of the fine structure constant. You see it here in the context of other uh, measurements to measure fine structure constant. Here are the three most accurate ones. That's us. That's Jerry Gabriel's measuring the electron stereomagnetic moment from which you can calculate alpha. And this is the previous atom interferometer. One interesting point to note is that atom interferometers seem to be compatible with, with each other, but there's a small statistical tension with G minus two measurements. Okay. Um, what I want to make want to make three points that Maureen has hinted at. I think in the future, be it applications in quantum computing, where very low error rate is crucial, be it <coughs> applications in quantum sensing for high energy physics, this is the title page of a Department of Energy report that was written in spring this year about how quantum sensing can help to do particle physics. And the remarkable thing is that the writing of this document was initiated by real particle physicists, not by atomic physicists pretending to be particle physicists. So it's catching on. We should try to use many body effects, not just as a systematic that needs to be suppressed as well as possible, but turn it into a solution. I think that's one of the key developments that will need to happen if we want to move further. We should be trying to advance precision measurement to a discovery, not trying to get better and better limits, but really think about what are the experiments that will most likely lead to discoveries. As atomic physicists change the shape of physics, the shape of physics changes atomic physics. For a long time, when I was a grad student, my impression was precision measurements as tests of fundamental physics are usually started in the following way. An atomic physicist has a great tool, such as an ultra-stable laser, and then thinking, what can I do with it? Well, let's use two of them in a cross-configuration and, and use it as a Michael's and experiment, confirming that space is isotropic. That's what I did my PhD on, right? It was not started by asking the question, how can I best discover something new in fundamental physics? It was asking the question, how can I use the technology that I have to do fundamental physics? And I think this will, at some point, turn around. And just like nobody thinks about the Higgs as a nifty way to apply a particle accelerator, we will have to think about how can atomic physics really help fundamental physics, even if that means we need to change the way we work? And all that, hopefully the first point, will enable the last point. Right now, coherences are usually measured in nanoseconds, microseconds, sometimes seconds, but those examples are rare. Can we isolate quantum systems for coherence of minutes and hours? That will help both the quantum sensing aspect and the quantum computing aspect. 
what are the technologies that we need to develop to make this happen? There seems to be no law of physics against it. It just seems to be a conspiracy of lots of noise sources that all seem to limit us at the same point. So I think these are the three big questions that I think the community will tackle. Use many body effects as your friend and not as your foe. Turn it around. Ask what can precision measurement do for fundamental physics, not the other way around it. How can we keep coherence alive for minutes, first hours, three big days? So that's all the introductory stuff I have. Um, this is um, the fluffy part of what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> it's a motivation. Why are we doing what we are doing? Right? Now I want to get a little bit into the heart of the technology. So I'm zooming from the very broad perspective into a very narrow perspective. Right? What are the nuts and bolts of my own field? Um, I hope you will see that the two things are related. Right? But, um, it's, a, it's a change of gears here. So if you have questions about the broad aspects, maybe ask them now. Um, in the meantime, uh, so most of the nuts and bolts parts I will do at the board. Because that's how you do that. Almost. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So quantum technologies. The first point I want to make is I want to divide and conquer. Um, precision measurements with atoms. That isn't all precision measurements. Some don't use atoms, right? So I'm focusing on these, leaving other things out. I think I can group them into three main um, categories. The first one would be clocks. So what's a clock? A clock is I take a set of atomic energy levels. I make their spacing as large as possible so that I get a high clock frequency allowing me to measure at high resolution. Right? And I make them as independent as possible from the environment. Trying to get, trying to shield magnetic fields and electric fields, bring the atoms into a state that doesn't respond to magnetic and electric fields so much and so on, right? And I'm going to measure the energy level spacing. An ideal clock would be totally independent of its environment as far as allowed by the laws of physics. It would still be subject to relativistic time dilation, but that's it, right? Then the second category I want to broadly call a magnetometer. Okay. In a magnetometer, I'm not interested in the DC and the constant energy level splitting. What I'm interested in is how does it vary as a function of external influences, such as magnetic fields. That could also be electric fields or what have you. I'll call it a magnetometer because what they have in common is this is one, this is one, right? In a magnetometer, I would try to shrink the energy level splitting a lot because it's an offset that I don't want to measure, right? So now I'm using two levels that might be completely degenerate or almost degenerate in the absence of magnetic fields. And I put the atoms in a quantum state that is as sensitive as possible to the external fields. And I'm measuring the same in shift. That's a magnetometer, right? So in some sense, I have become less dependent on the properties of the atom and more dependent on the properties of the environment because that's what I know. And the third thing is the atom interferometer. In that case, I want to cancel the influence of the atomic energy levels because I'm not usually interested in measuring them. I want to cancel the influence of external magnetic fields and so on on the atomic energy levels. All I'm interested in is how do external fields affect the spatial motion of the atoms, the external quantum state, not the internal quantum state. 
In an atom interferometer, I don't care which state the atom is in, which energy levels. I care about how do external potentials change the energy of the overall atom, and how do they move it around. Right? So in some sense, I have now removed the atom from the picture, and I'm treating it only as a billiard ball. It's an object with a mass that's moving around. Its quantum phase evolves according to the Royce relations or according to the WKB method or what have you. Right? That's in principle, all the math we do in atom interferometry can be done starting from the simple de Broglie relation for the metal wavelength of an object. Right? We've already talked about how an interferometer works in general. <coughs> what I have to do to make an atom interferometer is I have to have a beam splitter for atoms, a semi-transparent mirror for metal waves. I have to have mirrors for atoms, and I have to have a detector. Right? What I'm going to talk about a little bit now is the two building blocks. The first is how do I make beam splitters for atoms and for metal waves. And the second will be what geometries of atom interferometers are useful for which purpose. The friend calling me not good. Um, the most famous beam splitter for atom interferometers is a two photon Raman transition. Right? So, in principle, I could do a beam splitter for an atom by just shining a photon in that's resonant with some transition in the atom. And when the um, photon hits the atom, then the atom would feel the momentum kick from the photon. So, the photon momentum is h bar k. I'm not writing h bar omega over c because k is not omega over c except for a plane wave, and that's an important systematic effect. Okay, so h bar k is the photon momentum. Um, okay, so the photon brings the atom into an excited state, transfers energy, and it transfers momentum so that the atom will now fly into a different direction. I can Adjust the laser intensity such that the process happens with a 50% probability, and I've now created a superposition of states. In one state, the atom keeps going the way it went before, and in the other state, the atom has been kicked off one spread. In principle, this is a good beam splitter. A single photon hits the atom. This is actually a very modern thing that people have been starting to use an atom interferometry with a paper by the Tino group that came out just now. Um, but usually it's not a good idea because the excited state of an atom decays within nanoseconds spontaneously and then all your coherence is gone. So what's usually done is you send in a second beam with a slightly different frequency. Okay. And then what happens is, let's say the atom has two ground states, could be the two hyperfine ground states of the cesium or rubidium atom, right? And there's an excited state somewhere here. Obviously, this distance is not to scale. The first photon has an energy that's almost enough to excite the atom, but not quite, meaning that there's a detuning here, delta, right? The second photon has the exact energy that's needed to bring the atom from this virtual energy level to this real ground state energy level. Okay. So the atom absorbs the first photon, gets kicked to the right, or to the left from your point of view, right? And at the same time, the second laser beam stimulates the atom to emit a photon that way. So the atom gets a second kick, accelerating it further. You've now doubled the k, which is a good thing, right? And you have brought the atom back down into a stable state, which is also a good thing. So you've solved these two problems. And now we can write the usual equations. I will not bother you too much with those equations, right? But we might be interested in the two-photon Rabi frequency at which this happens, right? 
of the two photon Rabi frequency, let me just consider the simplest case that the two laser beams have the same intensity characterized by a separation parameter S. So, right, S is the ratio of each individual beam intensity with the separation intensity of the atom. Right? So you would say the two photon Rabi frequency is S times gamma squared, that's the line width of this excited state, over two times the DQ name. Right? Okay. Now reality isn't always that simple. Um, for one, there are usually many excited states. So if that happens, you have to sum up the matrix elements that the intermediate state is this one, or that one, or that one, right? And the two laser intensities may be different, in which case this all gets a little bit more complicated. But that's the gist of it, right? And then if you have that, and you keep the laser pulse running for a time t, then this is the probability that you'll find the atom in the state B. Let's call this B, let's call this A, right? If you keep running until the probability is 50%, it will be called a pi over 2 pulse. If you keep running until it's 100%, it will be called a pi pulse. That's how that works, right? Now let's take a look at how it works in practice, and we'll find we already went through this brightness slide. I'm sorry, I have it here again. Okay. These are the more horrible equations that um, tell you about the real case. So the first one is the two photon um, Rabi frequency. This is an example for a cesium atom, right? So what have I done to make this more realistic? I have more than one intermediate state. I have all these. So this could be the intermediate state, or that, or that, or that, right? And for each <coughs> intermediate state, there will be a different detuning delta that's in the denominator here, right? The two frequencies might not be completely resonant. There's a tiny bit of a detuning here. And then that's my um, two photon Rabi frequency. So these A and A and plus one are the amplitudes of the two electric fields. I assume that the um, electric field has frequency components 1, 2, 3, and n. There might be more than 2, right? And those are the matrix elements for the individual um, transitions. So that's your effective Rabi frequency. Now, nature isn't perfect, and sometimes the atom will go into the excited state despite the detuning. That's not what I want, but that's sometimes what I get. And when that happens, the excited state will spontaneously decay. So there's a single photon scattering rate when the atom absorbs a photon, that leads to decoherence. And so that rate is written here. It's slightly more complicated, right? And let's not go into detail. It takes forever to de... This is all, of course, suitable for inserting into Mathematica, and then you look up your Daniel Steck tables of the matrix elements and so on. Takes forever to debug. Um, okay, so that you want to keep very low. And the way you keep it low is you notice that this goes like 1 over the detuning delta, but this goes like 1 over delta squared. So using a large detuning makes this one go down faster than that. There's a final problem when it comes to precision measurement, and that's the AC star shift. While the laser is on, it will cause a differential AC star shift between these two levels. And that will enter my interferometer phase, and I don't want it. So that can be calculated too. And the important thing here is the minus sign, because I'm subtracting the star shift of this level from the star shift of that level. And I can use that to advantage. Let me show you a work out example. This is uh, the three quantities plotted for a cesium atom that's being driven by a laser. Um, and the laser does... Uh, anyway, let's, let's look at the graph first. So this is the detuning from the F equal to F equal 5 transition, okay? 
and they are all negative, you will note that they are all relatively small. Very often this will be measured in gigahertz, but here it's only measured in hundreds of megahertz. The reason for that will be apparent soon. This is the effective Rabi frequency. The dotted line is theory, the points are um, measurement, and I should note that this is not a tip. This is a straight experiment theory comparison, okay? So there will be another resonance here. That's why the two photon gravity frequency goes up as I make the detuning more negative. This is the differential AC star shift, and what you'll see is that it's zero here, okay? So just like clocks have their magic wavelengths where you can make an atomic, where you can make an optical lattice to hold the atoms, and the atoms, the clock transition doesn't get shifted by the lattice laser. Atom interferometers have their magic detuning where the laser intensity does not cause a differential AC star shift between the two levels. And this is the single photon scattering rate, and it's very small, which is good. In fact, we would like to be it even smaller. But which frequency do you choose? You choose the one with the lowest systematic effect. Because additional decoherence means you have a worse signal-to-noise ratio, but that you can overcome by averaging, right? But additional systematics you can usually not overcome by anything. So you pick this point. That's very important. This was the state of the art for a decade or so. The first atom interferometers were done pretty much simultaneously by three groups. Um, one was Fritz Riedle at PTB in Germany. One was Jürgen Gülnek at that time at ETH in Zurich. And the third was Steve Chu at Stanford. Right? This is what Steve Chu used. The other two used material beam splitters, microscopic ratings. So this was the state of the art for a long time. Why do you want to have something better? Well, first of all, this AC star shift sucks. It doesn't contribute to the signal, it only contributes problems, right? Second, you would sometimes like to have more momentum transfer. Two photons is already better than one, but if you could do many photons, then you could do this. You see here, measure interference ranges of an atom interferometer that used 18 photons to kick the atom instead of two. And the blue line, I'll admit, is a mathematical plot of how would this fringe look like if you use two photons. And you don't have to be an expert to see that, which fringe is finer, which will give you the higher resolution and measurement. Right? So people were trying to do what they call large momentum transfer. And by large, they really mean anything that's more than two photons. So how to do that? The principle is again the same. I'm shining in exactly two laser frequencies. And this time, I still have my old ground state. Somewhere here is the other hyperfine level, but I'm going to ignore that completely. This is never populated. Instead, my other ground state is this same ground state of the atom, but moving. So it has a slightly higher energy if it moves at a momentum of two photons. If it moves at a momentum of four photons, it has even higher energy and so on. Right. Four. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to shine in one laser that's not quite resonant with this transition, and a second laser that's not resonant with this transition. Okay. So the atom cannot go into this level, even though it exists. What it can do is again go up and down, and again, and again. And if I tune it in a smart way, then the resonance condition is met only if I absorb five photons and emit five photons. Okay? Whereas all the levels in the middle are detuned by some small amount. Let me just tell you how small this amount is. 
the energy of a cesium atom that has scattered two photons at 852 nanometer wavelength is just the energy of an 8 kilohertz frequency. So it's next to nothing, right? So those distances here are measured really in multiples of 8 kilohertz. That means energy conservation really needs to work hard to suppress this transition and enable that. So you need to be careful about your pulse being long enough so that energy time uncertainty doesn't hurt you. But it all works out, and when it works out, you get narrow fringes like that. Also, since you have only one internal ground state, you don't have a relative AC star shift between two internal ground states. Right? So this seems perfect. You get more momentum transfer, getting higher resolution. You don't have a differential AC star shift, so where's the problem? There's no free lunch, right? The problem is that this is a highly suppressed multi-photon process. The two-photon process is proportional to the electric field squared. This is proportional to the electric field to the power of 10. So you need a ton of laser intensity to make it happen. The second problem is that the only difference between your initial state and your final state is the motion of the atoms. That means you need a sample where this motion is sufficiently well-defined so that the difference is relevant, meaning you need to cool your sample to sub-recall temperatures. And finally, there is an analogy to the AC star shift here. It works in a completely different way, but it has the same effect, naming an unwanted phase in the atom interferometer. So let's take a look at the data. Um, ignore this. Ignore this. This is the, the exact interferometer geometry, but it doesn't matter for now. What I want to draw your attention to is this graph. Okay, the y-axis is a measurement for the phase shift in the interferometer. It's here expressed as a frequency, but ignore that. This will become clear later how it works, right? Whereas, so what happens is between these points, we verify the um, timing of our laser pulses. And we see that it causes a phase shift. Sometimes it seems to be very, very small, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. And this comes from solving the Schrodinger equation of the system. So that's a complicated undertaking because I have to, in principle, an infinite number of states, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. I can only solve it numerically by focusing attention to maybe 20 of these states, right? And then I crank numerically the Schrodinger equation for the atom inside the electric field of the two beams, and out comes this phase shift. Um, it's here investigated experimentally. So the delta is, let's suppose those two lasers are not 100% resonant, but there's a little detuning left behind here, delta. Okay. And this is the phase in radians. Okay, that's pretty large. It's measured in milliradians, even tens of milliradians. And again, the points are measured and the lines are theory. And again, there's no fit parameter here. So you see, we understand this diffraction phase. And we have ways to minimize this. So what happened here is you can choose a magic combination of pulse duration and intensity where the phase shift is essentially zero. Okay? You have to pay attention to it, but then you get it down. I want to point this out because you have gotten rid of the AC star shift, which is a much larger effect. If you don't cancel the AC star shift in Rana, you get phases that are measured in radians, not in milliradians. But you still have a problem that you need to deal with in the most precise measurement. All right. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Let me, so this is more about this. Let me just give you two very modern beam splitters. Um, modern in the sense that this hasn't even been published yet. 
What I did here is I showed you that the data has to do the job of two. It has to do two jobs. First, it has to generate a superposition of states. And second, it has to kick the atom with momentum. What if you separated those? And this is an idea by Paul Hamilton, who is my former postdoc, he's now assistant professor at UCLA, and he met my grad students at Demo. They started chanting at Paul had the following idea. Let's create the superposition with a microwave pulse, and then let's use adiabatic rapid passage for the momentum transfer. The advantage is that adiabatic rapid passage is a method to change the state of an atom that is not very sensitive to the laser intensity. I'm running out of time, so I won't explain it. <laughs> it uses a fancy sweep of the laser frequency. But the point is you get the same probability of momentum transfer for large variations of the laser intensity. That's important, because in reality, the atom have a finite-sized sample, and sometimes it's as big as the laser beam. So only the center sees the laser at the highest intensity, right? But you want high efficiency for all the atoms. So with that, we did to kick the atoms around, juggling up and down, applying more and more pulses. And you see that the efficiency per pulse is 99.6%. Okay? Even though the sample was relatively large compared to the laser. Please juggling into a problem that might one day be interesting for relative detection. As a final ingredient, you know what? Block oscillations are also important, and I'll talk about them tonight. So let's finish it here. Um, to wrap up, atomic physics, I think, is in the best tradition of physics that is relevant not just to physicists, but to people. And it's our job to make sure this keeps going and going in the right direction where the technology is more useful than possible. Um, 